Hello, my name is Kishwani. That's K E S H W A N I, Kishwani. We are here because we want to prepare for the GRE. We have been solving GRE math problems out of this book here. The official guide to the revised GRE, the second edition. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. We are finished doing almost all the math problems from this book. If there is any problem at all that gives you trouble, that gives you difficulty, and if you wish to watch the solution to it, you will find the solutions to almost all the problems from day number 251 through 400. From 251 through 400. The problems that appeared in this book, the second edition, they are almost all the same problem and appearing on the same page numbers as the ones that appeared in the first edition of the revised GRE. We are finished doing all the problems from this book. In the event that you are interested in watching the original solutions to the problems, you will find all the original solutions from day number 1 through 250. Right now, we are in the process of solving some quantitative comparison questions. Quantitative comparison questions, as you know, are still very big, very big chunk of the exam. They have not gone away. They are still a big part of the exam. Unfortunately for us, the newer books do not provide us with sufficient practice problems. For that reason, from day number 401, we began solving some quantitative comparison questions out of this book here, the 10th edition of the general GRE. We are right now on page number 342. Please turn to it. Page number 342. The very first problem that you see there on the page, problem number 11. Let's see what it has to say. Problem number 11 tells us that, problem number 11, let's first, let's first, let's first put down the percentile. Two thirds of people, two thirds of people who took the exam had no trouble with the problem. Here's what we are told. We are told that X and Y, X and Y are positive integers. X and Y are positive integers. They have to be whole numbers and they have to be positive. So far so good. We are also told that X is more than 1 and Y we are told is less than 2. What we are being asked to compare is column A which has X and column B which has 2 times Y. Let's see what we can do. X versus 2 times Y. I'm going to give you 5 seconds actually to do the problem yourself, you must always do all the problems yourself first as soon as I finish setting them up on the blackboard. Once you have done the problem yourself, then you compare your work against the work that you and I will do together in a few seconds time. I'll give you five seconds of pause and unpause the video. So here's, here's what's going on. We are being asked to compare x versus 2y and y we are told, y we are told is something less than 2. Well y is something less than 2 and y also needs to be a positive integers. It has to be a whole number, it has to be an integer, it has to be positive and it needs to be less than 2. By the time we put all three constraints on it, the fact that it needs to be positive, the fact that it needs to be a whole number, the fact that it needs to be less than 2, that pretty much narrows down. This implies that y has to equal 1. There is no other choice. Y cannot be anything else. Well, y cannot be 0, y cannot be negative 1, it cannot be, it cannot be 3 because it has to be less than 2. The only value that y can assume is 1. So this, this column is fixed. This column is fixed. It's just 2 times y. There is no choice. This column is fixed. This column will never change. The value of this second column, column B, is 2. What about x? x we know is more than 1. Well, if it's more than 1, it could very well be 2. If x happens to be 2, in which case the answer is going to be C. Or x could very well be x could very well be two million. Why not? X could be two million. Two million is more than one, in which case the answer is going to be A. And therefore the answer is D. There is no constraint on X. As long as it is positive and as long as it's integer and as long as it's more than one, well there are infinite possibilities for X. X could be two, three, four, five, six, anything it wants to be. So if it's two, answer is going to be C. If it's something more than two, its answer is going to be A. Therefore the answer is D. Number 12. Question number 12. In question number 12 we are told that question number 12 
63% of people got it right. We are told that 1 over r over 1 over t, we are told, equals 3 fifth. And we are being asked to compare column A versus column B. Column A, we are told, is r over t. And column B, we are told, is t over r. r over, r over t versus t over r. Again, I'll give you, pause the video, do the problem yourself. I'll give you five seconds to pause and unpause the video. I'm just going to erase the part that does not pertain to this problem so that it doesn't cause any confusion. This, this thing is from the previous problem. So here's the problem. 1 over r divided by 1 over t, we are told is 3 fifth. Compare r over t versus t over r. I'll give you five seconds to pause and unpause the video. Well, here we go. 1 over r divided by 1 over t, we know that one we know that one, one fraction is being divided by other fractions, we have to take the top fraction and multiply it by the reciprocal of the bottom fraction. And if we do that, 1 over t becomes t over 1, and that boils down to t over r, t over r, and we are told that, that is 3 fifths. t over r is 3 fifths. t over r is 3 fifths, this goes right here. And if 3 over t over r is 3 fifths, then r over t would have to be 5 thirds. r over t would have to be 5 thirds, which is more than 1. This is less than 1. The answer is the answer is A. Because 5 over 3 doesn't matter what it is. We know that it is going to be more than one, that fraction is going to be more than 1. That's going, that's going to be less than 1. Therefore, the answer is A. Number 13. Question number 13. Question number 13 is a geometry question. Question number 13 was such that exactly half the people got it right. I shouldn't really say exactly half the people because this percentile uh, could be the round on number obviously. That's uh, 50%. Here's what we are told. We are, we, are, we are given a rectangle x, y, w, x, y, z. Here is our rectangle that is given to us. w, x, y, and z. And we are told that uh, this is 4 by 8. 4 by 8. And here's what, what we are being asked to compare. Column A. Column A, we are told area area of a square area of a square whose perimeter equals the perimeter of the rectangle W X Y Z. That's the first column. We are being asked to compare the area of a square, a square whose parameter, a square whose perimeter happens to be the same exact parameter as the parameter of this guy versus, versus column B, which is 36, which is 36. Again, I'll give you, I'll give you five seconds to pause and unpause the video. Do the problem yourself, okay? Here we go. Well, the perimeter of this guy is 8 and 8, 8 plus 8 is 16, and 4 plus 4 is 8. So perimeter of this guy is 16 plus 8, which is 24. Perimeter is 24, and that perimeter has to be the same as the perimeter of the square. And this has to be the same as the perimeter of the square. Well, the perimeter of a square is simply four times the size. Four times the, not size rather, I meant to say side. In a square, the four sides are equal, therefore four, si four times this each side, now we know has to equal 24. Which in turn, which in turn implies that each side must be six. The square that we're dealing with is six by six. The square that we're dealing with is six by six. And what's the area of that square? So now we have to compare the area of the square 
which we know now is 6 by 6, the area of the square is going to be 6 times 6, which is, which is going to be 36. So I should have put down way over there. The area of the square is equals 36. The answer is C. The answer is C. I'll see you tomorrow, okay? Bye now.